Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Shauna Smith along with Dave Briggs. Let's get you up to speed on today's market action because we've seen a bit of a reversal here in the last hour of trading. We just got the Fed minutes out from the Fed's most recent meeting. Certainly a hawkish tone was taken during that meeting. And the fact that we might see these higher rates for longer as the Fed works to tame inflation. So that, of course, taking a toll on the market. You see it in the intraday charts. So those minutes were released right at 2 p.m. And we can certainly see the downward movement that we have seen the Dow briefly in negative territory, now up just 63 points. Taking a look at the other major averages, the S&P remaining in positive territory today for much of the day, I should say, at least in the afternoon, now up just about six tenths of a percent. NASDAQ 100, though, also falling into negative territory for just a few minutes, now up, though, just about a half of a percent. And taking a look at the sector action here as we try to figure out the most beaten down names in this market, energy by far, the worst performer. That, of course, has been the story for much of the trading day. In terms of the leadership that we're seeing, real estate up just over 2%. Communication services, materials, financials also holding on to gains. Let's get more details on those Fed minutes that were just released. Jen Schomberger has a closer look at that for us. Hey, Jen. Good afternoon, Shauna. No Fed officials thought it would be appropriate to cut rates this year, noting that the unwarranted easing in financial conditions could actually complicate the Fed's efforts to bring down inflation. Several participants underscoring that the Fed's median projection for rates of 5.1 percent, which is above the market's expectations, underscored the Fed's commitment to bring down inflation. All of this signaling to markets, we are not expecting to cut rates this year, even though you are pricing in some of that. And we are not budging unless inflation comes down. Members thought that price pressures could prove to be more persistent than anticipated, with the job market remaining so strong for longer than expected. While Fed officials saw reductions in inflation data for October and November as welcome signs, they stressed it would take substantially more evidence of progress to be confident that inflation was coming down. They noted that, quote, a restrictive policy stance would need to be maintained for them to be confident that inflation is on a sustained downward trajectory. Now, of course, the question du jour for investors, at what pace will the Fed uh, raise rates at future meetings, having slowed down to 50 basis points from 75 basis points. Well, Fed officials not tipping their hand in those minutes, noting only that they will base decisions on future rate hikes on data and the implications for inflation and the economic outlook on a meeting by meeting basis. Dave, back to you. The markets refuse to believe what Jay Powell tells them over and over repeatedly. Jen Schomber, excellent work. Thank you. Let's get Thanks. you up to speed now on the housing sector, perhaps a leading indicator of a potential recession. Mortgage applications falling 13.2 percent at the end of last week from two weeks prior. Holiday stuck in the middle there. While mortgage rates reversed their recent trend, the average 30-year fixed increasing to 6.58% from 6.34 for perspective, rates were 3.33 at the end of 2021. Now, demand for refinancing also dropping 16% and was a staggering 87% down from the same period in 2021. The biggest real estate market in the country right here in Manhattan, another slump as apartment sales plummeted 29% in the fourth quarter as prices declined for the first time since early 2020. We all know it was happening around that period of time. Let's get you up to speed now on the energy market with Jared Blickery. Well, let's take a look here. We got XLE, as Shauna just pointed out. That's the only sector in the red today. Let me just show you quickly the two-day performance since we're Two days into the new year, you can see XLE down 3.6%. Uh, we did get a little downdraft today on the FOMC minutes. Typically, they're not going to have an outsized effect, but it does affect the demand picture potentially. I think uh, another month or so, we're going to see more action from well, OPEC Plus, and we're also going to see China, the full reopening of them. It's probably going to be one of the dominant, uh, dominant themes going into the new year here. Now, XLE, over the last year, by far the biggest market gainer. That's up 40 
42%. And let's just take a look inside the energy stocks, energy markets, so we can see what's happening on the inside. Exxon up 61.5% over the last year. CV uh, Chevron up 40%. Schlumberday 55%. But one of the standouts is Occidental Petroleum. We know that's a Warren Buffett favorite. That's up over 80% over the last year. Really just trading sideways over the last, but looks about nine months there. Want to close here with a look at the futures market because we have seen, and this is going to be on an intraday basis, crude oil having the worst two-day slump in uh, several months here. This is over the last year, and you can see crude oil, WTI, a uh, little bit underwater over the last year. So really interesting. It's been a steady, steady, slow slog down. Uh, not any shocks that I could remember over the last nine months or so. Nevertheless, we're going to have to see what the new year brings. Lots of new factors. And with that, I'll send it back to you, Dave. Jared, thank you very much. All right, for more on those Fed minutes, let's bring in Sonia Meskin, head of U.S. Macro at BNY Mellon Investment Management. Nice to see you. So investors clearly surprised by what they heard today. How about yourself? Uh, yes, thanks so much for having me. Uh, I got to say, I'm not surprised, and I'll tell you why. Um, I do think the committee, as back in the summer, remains quite concerned about the recent loosening in financial conditions. And they came out very clearly, if you read the minutes, basically saying that. They said, we are concerned that the uh, our reaction um, function may be misinterpreted by the markets and therefore by the broader public. We are stepping, stepping down the uh, magnitude of hikes, but that should in no way slacken our commitment to taming inflation. The outlook for inflation remains uncertain. They tied it uh, specifically to services inflation. Everyone knows goods inflation is expected to come down, finally reverse from the previous couple of years. But services inflation, especially ex shelter, remains strong. Um, it is particularly um, uh, tied to strong wage growth and tight labor markets. And you see references of that all over the, the minutes. And I'm very much not surprised to see that. Yeah, so anyway, well, digging into this, I think the big question at this point, like Jim brought up before, was just the implications of future rate hikes, what that looks like, how aggressive they will potentially be, at least at the next meeting or two. What are you expecting to see? Well, they didn't really tip their hand in terms of 25 versus 50 basis points in the next meeting or two. Um, I would not be surprised if they go 50. I think that another point that got a little bit maybe less attention in the headlines, but is quite um, critical, is that the board's, the Fed staff's assessment of growth and the labor market has also improved since November. So what they're saying is that the staff, at least, does not expect um, unemployment to rise above their estimate of neutral. So neutral being uh, consistent with 2% inflation. Uh, they don't expect that until uh, at the end of 2024. Um, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if they continue to raise by 50 basis points unless uh, growth meaningfully deteriorates, which is not actually something we expect in the next couple of months. And what's your read on how well the Fed is handling inflation and where do you see the terminal rate? Yeah, I think that um, obviously they already made a mistake. They've even come out and acknowledged the mistake. Um, so now what they have to do is be more forceful than they would have had, wouldn't have been otherwise um, had they tightened sooner. So what they want to avoid is slacking now again, and then having inflation come back, especially in the more persistent sticky areas, such as services or wages. Um, and I do think that their estimates of above 5% terminal rate are reasonable to me, uh, because frankly, uh, once inflation remains persistently high, you really need real rates um, to rise above the rate of inflation. Um, so I do think there's an upside risk to uh, services inflation remaining relatively high and therefore rates having uh, policy rates having to go up above 5%. That's not what the market is pricing in, as you guys just recently mentioned. So that wedge remains. And I think you're going to you're going to see that reflected in asset prices and asset price fluctuations in the months ahead. 
And so, you taking a look at where things stand today, certainly the data has been mixed, and that's illustrated even today when we got the jolts data that was stronger than expected, really pointing to the fact that the labor market remains resilient. And then we got the manufacturing data showing further weakness. I guess, what's your assessment of where we stand today with, with the economy, what we could expect in terms of a possible recession? Sure. I mean, I do think that manufacturing being weak, um, is not something that's surprising. Uh, manufacturing is more exposed to global growth, which has been a bit weaker than U.S. growth. Manufacturing is also more exposed than the, uh, the U.S. economy on average to a stronger dollar. But recall that it's not the biggest part of the U.S. economy, while an important one. Um, we did have a manufacturing recession in around 2016, for example, but you know, the rest of the economy didn't slip into a recession. So it's conceivable to me that the economy overall, especially the services sector, can remain strong while manufacturing remains relatively weak for some time ahead. The employment component of manufacturing, by the way, has remained a little bit stronger than the rest of the um, ISM report. All right, Sonia Meskin, always great to have you. Thanks so much for breaking down the minutes. Certainly something that has spooked the market here in the latest hour of trading. Well, we are just getting started here on Yahoo Finance. Coming up, the major indices looking to end the Santa Claus rally period on a positive note. All three of the major averages in the green today. We're going to break down what the charts might tell us about what's in store for the new year. And Salesforce, the latest big tech company to announce layoffs, will tell you what the company is saying. And Equinox's president explaining why his gym is telling people we don't speak January, certainly sparking outrage online. We'll have all that for you coming up.
Let's check in here on the markets with about 45 minutes to go in the trading day. All three of the major averages back in positive territory. The last hour and 15 minutes or so, we've seen some volatility in the markets as investors digest the latest minutes from the Fed meeting, showing that the Fed once again reiterating the fact that it will stay hawkish and do what it needs to do in order to get inflation under control. Let's talk about what this means for the market heading forward. For that, we want to bring in Jeff Bierman. He's Theotrade Chief Market Technician. Jeff, it's great to have you here. I know you are focused on the technical. So taking a look at the technicals and where we stand today, what is that signaling to you? Well, you got to take a few things into account. There's a lot of cross currents, Shauna. And what I mean by cross currents is there's a lot of mixed feelings and emotions in terms of interest rates, upward pressure on wages. How far do we have to bring inflation down? Even though oils come down, it doesn't necessarily mean that prices have come down because oil is not a component part actually of the CPI. It says we exclude food and energy, and that sort of makes things, you know, in a, like a sort of uncertain situation. And if there's one thing the market hates, it hates uncertainty. It hates lack of clarity. And you're getting that, and it's being reflected in that volatile price action. So if you think it's going away, I don't think it's going away for quite some time until the market gets better clarity in terms of where the inflation rate needs to get to, where the top tick and interest rates are, and next, what are the earnings going to be reported for the quarter, which I think the expectations are still a little bit too high. Jeff, let's go piece by piece in terms of those components. And let's start with how far you think the Fed has to go to bring inflation down. It doesn't seem like the markets want to believe Jerome Powell. Well, it's one thing to you know to believe something, and one thing to be in reality. And I think this market's been pretty much detached from reality for a very long time. Um, Jerome Powell has kept a very z sort of a zero interest rate policy, and now that that's behind us and out the window for quite some time, the market needs to recalibrate its expectations. Dave, it really does. I call this a transition period, in which the market was living on a Fed fueled fantasy. And now we're actually dialed into a, a certain level of reality where people need to ratchet down their expectations from, let's say, expected growth of 5 to 10 percent to even maybe 5 percent or below for an extended period of time. So, Jeff, let's talk about what has already been priced into the market when it comes to Fed policy and this risk of recession. How big of a risk do you see that being at this point? I think that I think the uh, recession itself is already in play. I mean, there's different uh, de definitions of a recession per se, Shauna, mm -hmm. as in two negative quarters of GDP. That's old fashioned and I'm not against it, but there's other things that are at play here of a recession, such as rising interest rates, rising inflation, lower profit margins, and higher unemployment. And unemployment right now is just starting to uptick. I mean, you had Salesforce.com announce 10,000 layoff here. You had Goldman Sachs uh, announced last week an 8% layoff across the board. I think this is just the beginning of layoffs that could take the market down possibly 10 to 15% this year, but it all depends upon how well the Fed can manage inflation and interest rates because you cannot detach the two or from one from another. Speaking of, uh, the bifurcation between growth and value stocks, what's your projection ahead, Jeff? It's the highest I've seen in a long time. They're, listen, Dave, they've started to correct it, started, but they still have a long way to go. Like, for instance, I, I was explaining earlier that Procter & Gamble trades at a 23 to 26 multiple. It's growing at about 2 to 3%, and a lot of people associate Procter & Gamble as a value stock, but it's priced as a growth stock. And then you take a stock like Kohl's in retail, KSS, which has been badly, badly battered. It yields better than 8%. It trades at a multiple less than six. And you can see the bifurcation in what Kohl's is supposed to be a growth stock priced as a value stock and what Procter & Gamble is supposed to be a value stock priced as a growth stock. So all of this is part and parcel of sector rotation based upon an impending recession perception. But the fact of the matter is, until that bifurcation is rectified, this market's going to stand a very little chance of rallying this year. Values in play, growth is out, and eventually that bifurcation, like I said, is going to be rectified. And when that convergence happens, that will help the market turn itself around eventually. 
And Jeff, in addition to the moves that we're seeing in the equity markets, I know you're also taking a close look at what we're seeing play out in the bond market. The 10-year yield, we've been trying to make sense of the levels that we have seen. Although more recently, we've, we've remained relatively range balanced today. We're right at 371. What is that signaling to you? I call it a happy place, Shauna. The mar- it's, it's a happy place. It's saying, listen, below three, not feasible. But somewhere between, let's say, three, three, five, and maybe a five and a quarter handle is where the market may fluctuate most of the year, depending upon the debt, the Fed's data dependent decisions. So I think that we're capped at five and a quarter. I think the Fed's going to set some type of mandate saying, listen, we don't need to go by five and a quarter. That's an overshoot. But then again, for those looking for a pivot and a cut, that's also out of the cards. And that's just not going to happen unless we get inflation below a four handle and we're still sitting at a seven handle. So I think maybe we stay between three and five and a quarter. And if you time weight average it, we might just fluctuate between three, five and four or five for the better part of three to four to six months from where we are now. Buckle up quickly, Jeff. You say the great resignation has backfired. And what do you see that reflected? Well, a couple of years back, Dave, you had 8 million people who said, this is an opportunity for me to change my lot in life. And there's nothing wrong with that. It was the COVID. People made decisions with their lives and they were laid off and they had to kind of reconfigure their their job positioning. And so when 8 million people quit, half of them went into, you know, starting their own businesses. Other half worked for other people, but worked on a part-time basis. Well, that thing is now backfiring because with layoffs coming forward, with upward pre- pressure on wages, and we're start- kind of slowly sinking into a warm bath of a recession, that type of that great designation works wonders in a in a bull market, in a growing economy. But in a declining economy or a compressed economy, moving into a, some type of mild recession, it actually turns out to be the worst of all possible worlds because now these people who have set their sights on starting new businesses and doing work from home. Well, when that work is not available and the capital is not there, there's going to be a lot of people, maybe a third or a half of those, who are going to find themselves probably having to go back to work in the gig economy. Perhaps it's something like part-time at Dash or at Lyft or even at Uber just to make ends meet. So I think the great resignation for that first year, Dave, was a great idea. But in a recession, it's completely backfired now, and you can start to see it play out. No question. Excellent stuff from Jeff Bierman. Appreciate that, sir. Thank you. Coming up, the tech world converging in Las Vegas for CES. Find out what new products we have our eyes on after the break.
Shares of Salesforce rising more than 3% today as investors cheer mass layoffs. The software company cutting around 8,000 jobs or 10% and the latest headcount cut in the tech sector. Said CEO Mark Benioff, quote, the environment remains challenging and our customers are taking a more measured approach to their purchasing decisions. Salesforce, like many tech companies, boomed during the pandemic with people hunkering down at home. With the soaring revenues came similar headcount, growing from about 48,000 to just under 80,000 at the end of October. That's an increase of more than 30%, Shauna. It is not the beginning of tech layoffs. It appears to be far from the end. It certainly does. And I thought it was interesting, Benioff really just taking responsibility for this, for the fact that Salesforce grew way too quickly. He wrote part in that letter that you just wrote that we hired too many people leading into this economic downturn we were facing. And I take responsibility for that. And I think this is largely reflective of the trends that we're seeing more broadly throughout the industry rather than this being a Salesforce specific issue. Because when you take into account the fact that clients have been starting to scale back some of their spending, a lot of that being done in the uh, enterprise space, which clearly affects Salesforce and more reflective of the softening that we're seeing more so in the landscape rather than Salesforce losing some of that ground or losing market share to some of its competitors. The stock, Dave, has been hammered over the past year, shares off nearly 50 percent. I think many on the street were maybe not expecting, but weren't necessarily going to be surprised if Salesforce was in fact forced to lay off people given the fact that they scaled so quickly. But that 10% number might have been a little bit higher than mm -hmm. what some analysts were initially expecting to see. I think it most similarly follows the Amazon story in that another tech company that yeah. just really overbuilt during the pandemic and had to cut back under Andy Jassy. A little different than the meta story, which invested too heavily in, of course, the metaverse. If there's any sprinkling of good news, five months of severance and benefits for those employees. And a uh, ZipRecruiter survey recently found that 79% of tech employees who were laid off found a new job in the next three months. Now, the question is, Shauna, and I think the question that Jay Powell is asking is, are those new jobs going to be at the same salary or lower and bring down inflation uh, increases? That's that's what he needs, the yeah. wage inflation to begin to come down. Well, at least at this point, it seems like the employee still has the upper hand. Obviously, it varies from industry to industry. But as these layoffs tend to increase, or if it keeps on the trend that we have been seeing, then the employer will have the upper hand and maybe we will see salaries begin to come down a bit. And simply, people aren't able to negotiate maybe for the salary that they want at their next yeah. job. All right, well, let's move on here because the biggest names in tech, they're in Las Vegas this week for CES. One of the big headlines so far, Roku announcing its own TV line. Ali Garfinkel is in the middle of all that action at the conference live in Las Vegas. Ali, what can you tell us? It's great to see you, Shauna. So first things first, this is a move on Roku's part that has been rumored for some time. And it's important to say there's actually range. They're coming out with a range of TVs. So there's a lower end, there's a higher end. And the price range is also equally wide, right? You have TVs that are going to be moving for about 119 and TVs that are going to be moving for 999. So, you know, it's important to say this is happening for Roku on the heels of a really difficult year. Of course, you just mentioned layoffs. Roku, another company that did layoffs substantially this past year. They also, their shares are down 81% last I checked a couple, like about, about half an hour ago, as in the last 12 months. So it's been a difficult time for them, but they, they came out to see yes, and they were really making a show of this big move for them, frankly. So lots of new tech there on display. Ali, what else do you have your eye on? Autonomous vehicles are pretty big here, Dave. Now, that means a lot of different things, first of all. But there's also, you know, there's a lot to say about data here. Now, what does that mean, really? I, I talked to a couple different companies about this, and one of them was Mobileye. For example, what they have is 120 million vehicles on the road that have their tech in it. Now, what does this mean? It means they're using driver assist to, and computer vision to create the data that will make it possible for vehicles to be more autonomous. We also saw it worked with another company called Avive, the semi-truck that you see, that you're going to see at some point up there. That is 
an autonomous semi-truck. It's autonomous because it has LiDAR 4D. Now, what does that actually mean? It means that they can actually determine the velocity of something coming in your direction. And that data is really important when it comes to making these autonomous vehicles safe. Because while autonomous vehicles have made headlines, they're also incredibly scary to a lot of people and a lot of people fear them. And the thing I've learned here, Dave, I would say is that the road to autonomy is paved with data. No doubt about that. It is frightening to conjure up an autonomous semi on the roads, but with the shortage of truck drivers, that needs to happen in the years ahead. Ali Garfinkel, thanks so much. We'll check back with you next hour. Coming up, Microsoft and the biggest lagger in the NASDAQ 100 will tell you why the stock was downgraded. Next. Time for our triple play. Three stocks that we're watching in the final 30 minutes of trading. We have Alibaba, GE Healthcare, and Microsoft. Let's kick it off with Alibaba. It's one of the top trending tickers on Yahoo Finance today. Shares gaining. Look at that. Up nearly 13%. The move to the upside coming after regulators approve a plan for Ant to raise $1.5 billion. Now, this raises the optimism out there that China's clampdown on its tech sector is going to be easing. Alibaba, which owns a stake in Ant, it was up pretty significantly today. We're looking at the biggest intraday gain that we have seen since at least November. It's by far or far from the only uh, U.S. Chinese listed stock moving to the upside today. JD.com, Pinduoduo, Duo, both also uh, substantial moves higher today. You look at JD.com up nearly 15 percent. And Andre, when you take a look at the optimism over in China. Some of the investment opportunity I think we can look at there. Certainly have seen those stocks rise recently over the last several weeks with the rolling back of the zero COVID policy. Although questions remain as case counts continue to climb, what that signals for the economy, what that could mean for the markets overall there. Absolutely. And you're still, of course, contending with the idea that this isn't just a clear chit, right, for the for the companies when it comes to the regulatory space as well. We've got, you know, still some pressure from Beijing and Washington 
on what that means about, you know, the potential of them delisting. I don't think that that has gone away. But yes, to your point about the optimism, I think definitely with what's going on with the zero COVID policy pulling back, with the optimism of attention on the economy at the least, uh, this is definitely, you know, a good signal. Clearly, investors are, are signaling yeah, that. They're, excited, so, about they're today, excited about it. Well, let's get to my pick. GE has finally spun off its health unit, creating the newly listed GE Healthcare on the NASDAQ, which began trading today. The parent GE will still have nearly a 20% stake in the spinoff. And while this isn't a new business line for GE, it does signal the appeal of an industry that accounts for nearly 20% of the country's GDP. Between the influx of tech and other consumer brands in recent years, everyone is wrangling for their piece of the $4 trillion pie. I feel like I could talk about this all the time. <laughs> tracking, well, you know, while tracking tech and technology sectors attempts to infiltrate the space has been top of mind for investors. Brands like Best Buy, you see retail pharmacies and others that you recognize, like, as you can see on your screen, Lyft, Uber, UPS, you wouldn't think has its own health unit. So increasingly, these companies are trying to find new avenues to capitalize on what is a sector that just won't quit. Medtech especially, which often covers devices, is an area of growth as more companies tinker with the idea of consumer-facing health devices. That came, of course, we saw during the pandemic pandemic, more remote monitoring, more wearables. And so these companies are really trying to get in on that space. Meanwhile, you've got legacy med sec tech, -er, the med sec tech, <laughs> med tech sector. Wow, I didn't realize I was going to have that tongue twister in there. <laughs> Dominated by big pharma. Think of J&J &J and uh, Medtronic and the like. That's going to be really interesting to watch because they have been watching consumer habits and you've seen some of these big players spin out or not pay as much attention to consumer brands, but also, uh, you know, what consumers demand as patients, whether you're in the outpatient setting or where you're looking at rem remote monitoring, wearables and the like, that's really going to drive the strategy of these companies, I think, in the coming years. And a company some feel will be worth some $50 billion. This is going to be a huge spinoff. And, and really the story of GE moving forward is going to be one of the stories of the year, in particular, the shedding of its power business. My eyes on GE Aerospace, the one that's worth the most money, somewhere in the neighborhood of $100 billion, they believe, spinning out more than $20 billion annually in revenue. My play is Microsoft, the stock slumping on a downgrade from UBS over its cloud services and office suite. UBS lowered the stock to neutral from buy and cut the price target by 50 bucks to 250. Analyst Carl Kierstedt writing Microsoft's Azure cloud unit is, quote, entering a steep growth deceleration that could prove to be worse in fiscal 23-24 than investors are modeling, end quote. They added the market could be reaching saturation. Now, on the bright side of the information, the information is actually reporting that Microsoft planning to launch a version of Bing that uses chat GPT to answer search queries in a bid to make Bing more competitive with Google. Clearly, investors don't believe that's going to happen. If you look at what happened with the stock, Microsoft lost 29% of its value last year and shares falling more than 5%. So clearly, investors are not thinking Bing is going to be much of a Google competitor. You know my thoughts on this. I'm on a Yahoo Finance Island. I think ChatGPT <laughs> is going to change the way in which we live and work, Shauna. Yeah, I, I don't know if I'll go that far. It will be interesting to see what happens with it. I'm still, I have a lot of questions. I don't think Bing, maybe this makes either. it a little bit sub-competitive. I don't think Bing will compete. <laughs> no, I know, Bing's I know, a mess. I know. <laughs> Bing is a mess, Bing's but maybe memo. it makes it a little bit more competitive when you stack it up against Google. But Microsoft is real interesting when you take a look at the downturn that we have certainly seen in that stock. Dave, you mentioned off 29% in a 2022. Wall Street, though, is pretty optimistic despite this downgrade. 90% of analysts covering Microsoft right now actually have a buy rating on the stock. There's no sell ratings. Maybe a lot of that has to do with valuation. But I was surprised that that significant of a number are optimistic on Microsoft given the landscape right now for tech, higher rates, what that means for many of these companies. Chat GPT. And cloud too. Chat GPT. Yeah. Maybe they're all listening to you. It's clearly they're Chat very GPT. bullish on Chat GPT. I just, I just want to be a kid. I just want to be a kid in high school with Chat GPT out right now. I just, I'm going to throw that out That's there. That's one of the big stories in this country. I love it. How teachers will police that. Yeah, it's, it's no going idea. to be tough. All right, we got to go here. But coming up next, theft is becoming a growing issue for retailers. Find out what stores can do about it when we come back.
All right, shares of retail giant Target up slightly despite a downgrade from Wells Fargo. Analyst Edward Kelly writing that opportunities in consumer staples retail names look, quote, don't look particularly compelling to start the year. Here to discuss what lies ahead for retail is Mark Matthews, National Retail Federation VP of Research Development and Industry Analysis. Good to see you, Mark. So I know you can't get into particular companies, but what is a downgrade of Target when it comes to that broad picture in retail ahead say to you about what's coming, what's on the way? Well, you know, I think we're relative, relatively bullish as we uh, head into 2023. You know, the consumer still remains in a relatively strong position. So I think what we need to remember is that, you know, individual companies have individual issues. But when you look at the industry as a whole, you know, the consumer is, uh, they, they still have uh, 1.5 trillion in excess savings that they can call on. So, you know, as we look into 2023, uh, you know, we've seen strong growth, uh, you know, over the last three years. Uh, 7% in, uh, in 2020, 14%, which was really unbelievable in, in 2021. And it looks like we're going to finish th this year at uh, over 7%. So, you know, that, that's strong momentum going into, uh, in, into 2023. Mark, that 7% growth, though, is that just because of inflation, the fact that people are simply paying more for goods this year? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. Uh, and uh, our numbers are... Uh, they're not real numbers, so uh, what we have to do is we have to back inflation out of there. But even when we back inflation out of there, uh, there is still real growth in there. Uh, not uh, you know not you know a, a big number, but you know consumers are still spending on retail. What, what's interesting is uh, you know a lot of people have been talking about you know a shift back to services as we return to normal. Uh, we've seen people return to normal, but we haven't seen a reduction in the share of wallet allocated to retail. So people are probably overspending a little bit and continuing to spend it in the retail space. One of the other uh, interesting parts of that target downgrade was the word shrinkage. And that's not from George Costanza for you Seinfeld fans out there. That is theft, retail theft. It's been a major issue with Target. How big an issue is it uh, retail wide? Do you have the numbers? Yeah, well, it's a hundred billion dollar problem for our industry as a whole. Uh, so it's uh, it's a big problem. Uh, and when we talk to retailers, uh, you know, they are telling us that this is a major concern for us for them. And you know, probably the thing that you know we're all worried most about is uh, you know the organized retail crime element of it. Uh, those things that you know we we hear called smash and grab. Uh, because there are, you know, organized retail crime criminals out there that are targeting retail, and uh, you know the, the violence associated with that uh, is hugely problematic. But also, you know, the amount of goods that they are stealing from retailers is is having a dramatic impact. Is there a prevailing wisdom? Like, what is the industry going to do collaboratively to stop it or to curb it? Well, you know, we need uh, the, the government, uh, local government, uh, national government to uh, to work with us. And, you know, uh, luckily, we, we have seen some some progress on that front. You know, we've seen some uh, some bills introduced that, uh, that we believe are going to be helpful. But uh, it's going to take a concerted effort on behalf of law enforcement, on behalf of government, on behalf of the retail industry to all work together and make sure that uh, this is an issue that uh, we can get to the bottom of and, you know, make sure that, uh, you know, it's not low hanging fruit for uh, for organized retail criminals to uh, to target the retail industry. Yeah, target Walmart, Walgreens, Home Depot, all calling out theft as a real threat to their business. Mark, let's talk about what's working and what's not working for retailers right now. Because in 2022, certainly we saw many discount retailers outperform as some consumers decided to trade down in terms of where they were spending. Also, the private labels, which tend to be cheaper, were one of the outperformers in 2022. Do you see that trend continuing this year? Yeah, so you know we know with uh, inflation happening that you know consumers are are making decisions uh, with their wallet, uh, and those decisions aren't just about you know trade-offs between essentials and non-essentials. You know, there, there are also decisions about you know whether you're going on holiday, uh, you know whether you're uh, staycationing. There, there are lots of different decisions that retailer uh, that uh, consumers have to make when it comes to uh, deciding how to spend their money. Uh, but you know, one of the easier things to do is to uh, you know maybe not buy that you know organic grass-fed uh you know expensive uh bottle of milk and, and trade down like you said uh, so you know we're certainly seeing that behavior uh where we're seeing consumers begin to uh be a little bit more frugal in, in terms of their choices
One other trend I want to quickly touch on is uh, social commerce ahead. How significant do you think that is in the next couple of years now that Amazon is getting in the game with its TikTok-like competitor? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and you know, the way I would position it is this, you know, some of the things that we do today, uh, you know, like I, I can walk into a store, you know, pick up something I bought online, look at a, you know, a store plan, you know, see exactly what I want to find, where it is and, you know, how much of it is in stock. You know, these are things that I, you know, I wouldn't have thought of 10 or 15 years ago. So there's constantly innovation going on. There are constant uh, developments in there. Social commerce is one. And, you know, we asked consumers about it uh, recently. And, uh, you know, leading into the holidays, we asked if, if they plan to use uh, social commerce. And 25% of them said that they either had or did plan to use it uh, going into the holidays. Now, what's interesting is uh, actually the breakup of that. It was 31% men versus 19% women. No, we we're actually expecting it to, to break the other way. So uh, it's not just uh, you know women who are out there uh, using these social commerce uh, platforms. It's, it's men and it's older men uh, as well. Interesting. Dave, I think you're one of those oh, women, yeah. aren't you? I'm a sucker for Younger. social commerce. All right. Yeah. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. Time. It makes it so much easier when you're buying this stuff. All right, Mark Matthews of National Retail Federation. As always, thanks so much for joining us here. Coming up next, Elon Musk announcing Twitter is reversing yet another policy. We're going to tell you what they are changing now. And Coinbase reaching a settlement with New York regulators. We'll have the story for you after the break. Twitter lifting its ban on political ads, reversing the policy that was put in place by Jack Dorsey back in 2019. Now, he tweeted back then that, quote, political speech has significant ramifications that today's democratic infrastructure may not be prepared to handle. Now, with the more politically outspoken Elon Musk in charge, could be seeing political ads back at Twitter. Twitter safety tweeting that it believes, quote, that cause based advertising can facilitate public conversation around important Topics, Dave, an interesting reversal here from Twitter. Not something that's necessarily surprising given the fact that ad revenue is so important 
to their business. And yeah. we know a number of companies have been pulling back on advertising on the platform ever since Musk uh, took over. Yeah, 90 percent of the revenue there at Twitter is from ads. But now if Jack Dorsey felt that we couldn't handle it in 2019, we are certainly not built to handle it now. Mm -hmm. Far more divisive, far more inflammatory. I fear for that and what it does to the platform. I also can't help but wonder how significant it is in terms of revenue. The last election was the 2018 midterms only generated around $3 million on $3 billion of annual revenue. So may not be the difference maker that Twitter wants and desperately needs at this point. All right, let's take a look at Coinbase shares right now ahead of the close. You can see shares up uh, just over 1% with the... Uh, Crypto focused company agreeing to pay a $50 million fine to the New York State Department of Financial Services. Financial regulators issued the fine on claims Coinbase allowed customers to open accounts without conducting sufficient background checks and therefore violated anti money laundering laws. Our David Hollerith has been following the story. David, I butchered the uh, the numbers there, up 11%. Bad eyes need the glasses to read anything on that television screen there. Uh, what's the latest? Hey, well, yeah, I, I mean, I wear contacts, so. Uh, <laughs> Same, uh, saves us. Yeah, in addition to the uh, 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 $50 million fine that they have to pay, um, it's also they have to put in about $50 million more for the next two years um, towards their compliance department. And of course, this is coming from the New York State Financial Services Department. Um, and the um, superintendent has come in and sort of explained this in the release. And uh, essentially, um, it's an issue of growth, which is obviously interesting because that is a reoccurring problem for crypto. I would say this year, over the last year, is, I guess we could say. So um, essentially what happened is they had a compliance, a transaction monitoring system. And over time, they let the amount of alerts that they, they had unanswered in terms of unknown um, transactions uh, accumulate. And they had been uh, repeatedly asked for uh, more compliance by the state regulator. And, Clearly, this comes during a time where a lot of, you know, after FTX, everyone is expecting, um, has to assume the worst, at least if you're a regulator, yeah. And certainly, well, everybody wanted the next shoe to drop. Yeah, yeah, they do. Yeah, and I think there's just a lot of concern, just in general, what this means for crypto going forward and what the crypto space even looks like over the next 12 months. But David, you mentioned FTX. Let's talk about the latest developments that we're just getting today, because there certainly has been this fight over shares of Robinhood tied to SBF at FTX. What can you tell us? Yeah, um, I, so uh, today, uh, uh, FTX lawyers in the bankruptcy case. Uh, have pointed out that the Justice Department um, in the criminal case has is in the process or potentially has already, the language wasn't very clear, seized the Robin Hood shares that were originally bought by Sam Bankman Freed. Uh, now, the situation that's interesting here is uh, they were bought through a shell company called Emergent Ventures. Um, and at one point during sort of the last uh, days of FTX before they filed for bankruptcy, um, they were also, uh, the sh these shares were promised as collateral to BlockFi, the crypto lender that has went bankrupt because of FTX. So um, there's a bit of a, of a change up between the creditors, BlockFi being one of the largest, um, who are trying to get their hands on these shares now. Um, they're worth about uh, $460 million now. Um, that's obviously gone down a little bit, but. Um, it's still the biggest piece of value existing right with yeah the FTX yeah I'm yeah. not I mean not last year but obviously it's the asset that has held the value the most right mm -hmm. other than a few pieces of real estate that's really all they've got all right David Hollerith good stuff thank you man coming up we're counting down to the closing bell on Wall Street stay with us here on Yahoo Finance Live
All right, we're just a couple of minutes away from the closing bell. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery. Jared, you've been watching out for Santa's sleigh over the past week. What's the word? Coal or presents for investors, my friend? Depends on your market. Pick your poison here. For the S&P 500, for the benchmark, guess what? It's going to be a little bit of... Uh not coal, I don't know, 63 <laughs> basis points over seven days. I'm excited. <laughs> Look at that sideways choppy action. Uh, nevertheless, it did end in the green here. The Dow, I think, is off uh, a little bit less than that. Well, 62 basis points, that's pretty comparable. And the NASDAQ is what is ending in the red by about 30 basis points. But why do we focus on this so much? And I'll show the, the Russell 2000 as well, up 1%, a little bit more than that. By the way, small caps this time of year tend to outperform, so keep that in mind. But why do we talk about this? Well, that's because the Santa Claus rally pretends it has a little bit of predictive power about the new year. So there's also something called the first five days of January. The first five trading days is going to be over next Monday and then the entire month. As the saying goes, as goes January, so goes the year. That's just a statistical tendency, but that's what we're looking at. Now, here's the NASDAQ 100 over the last seven days. You're going to see some outsized drawdowns by, for instance, Apple down 4.5%, a little bit better off than it was yesterday. Tesla down only 10%, but check out the sector action here. Uh, energy is, uh, let me see, where is energy on this? I guess it's somewhere in the middle, uh, but it looks like communication services in the, is in the lead there. That's up 4.5% over this time frame, followed by financials, real estate, industrials. Interesting to see the mix. Communication services, by the way, which houses Meta, Verizon, Disney, kind of a hodgepodge of different communication groups there. That was one of the worst sectors of last year. So the fact that it's the best of this time period, I don't know, take that with a grain of salt. Want to end with uh, January overall. Now, this is uh, some. these are some statistics that were compiled by a Stock Traders Almanac, and this shows January performance. It is a number two month out of the year for for the Dow, and it's a number one month for the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. Usually in January, we're seeing gains of 4% for the S&P, 4% for the Dow just about, and about 6.8% for the NASDAQ. Pretty good track record here. This is, by the way, I should add, this is the pre-election year since 1950. So this is the third year of the presidential cycle. So pretty compelling statistics here. We're going to have to see what happens in the rest of the month. But as I lead us into the closing bell for today, let me just take a look at some of our market leaders. I looked at the seven days. This is going to be today's market only. Nice to see a little bit of bounce back from Tesla and Apple. I thought it was pretty ignominious start to the, to the year yesterday, uh, given that they both started the week off or started the new year off at 52-week lows. Here's that closing bell. The second trading day of the year is now in the books, and we're looking at gains across the board. The Dow up 133 points, S&P up just about seven tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq also holding on to gains as investors digest the latest minutes from the Fed. Let's talk about what this means going forward. For that, we want to bring in Kathy Entwistle, Morgan Stanley Managing Director. We also have Dory Wiley, Commerce Street Capital CEO and President. Kathy, let me start with you because the volatility that we saw, at least in today's trading action, and more specifically this afternoon, the Fed once again reiterating the fact that they are going to remain aggressive. It seemed like the market was a little bit spooked by that. What's your takeaway on what we heard from the Fed today and what it signals going forward? Absolutely. I think what it signals is that it's not over yet. And everybody's trying to figure out, is there more pain or is there room for gain in this market? For, for now, the Fed will hold and we're going to have to wait to make sure that inflation is pared down quite a bit more, and they need to see some of those signals. What we're really concerned about, though, is we think a lot of the Fed has been priced into the market. We don't think that corporate earnings is showing where it needs to be yet, and that's coming next. And that first quarter will have a little bit of a shoe to drop there. So the corporate earnings is really the issue we're concerned about at this point. Dory, were you surprised by what you heard from the Fed minutes and how much more work do you believe the Fed has to do? Are we talking about 225s and hold or some that feel an additional full percentage point still ahead? Well, I, was, I wasn't surprised. There's been a gap all year between market expectations and the Fed. And unlike with Greenspan, the, the, uh, uh, the Fed chairman and the Fed board have been extremely explicit about what, the way they feel and what they're going to do. And the market doesn't like the answer a lot of time, almost like a spoiled child. Uh, so, so I agree with that. I think we got a little more pain ahead. The earnings aren't need to be adjusted down. Uh, the market's going to be a little overpriced. I mean, you shouldn't have forward earnings price uh, 
same multiple as current earnings. So earnings have got to come down or the multiple's got to go up. And I know the multiple's not going to go up and the earnings aren't, aren't adjusted down enough. So uh, the Fed, we saw the job number came out today. Openings were strong. We need higher unemployment numbers. The Fed is clearly resolved on bringing inflation down. And inflation is going to be a little bit more stubborn to the downside than, than I think the market realizes. Kathy, you mentioned your big concern here is corporate earnings, what we could see over the next quarter, and that being the next shoe to drop. I guess, how bad do you think it could potentially get? Well, our firm is calling for potential 3,000 or 3,300 potential drop first quarter on the S&P 500, but to end the year at 3,900. So what that tells me is the first quarter, we have to be very cautious, stay defensive, potentially park our money in areas that are, are safer and more liquid. Even savings deposits are paying 4% uh, at this moment. And that's a nice, you know, clip and return coupon for, for clients. So yeah, it can get, it can get bad. Listen, c corporations, when you think about it, there's like a trifecta. You've got the issue of, uh, you know, supply chain issues um, and where are they going to higher costs with inflation, higher borrowing costs and, and, customers or clients not purchasing like they were. And that has to come and fall out somewhere. And it will fall out in the price of the company stock. Dory, do you agree with that estimate for the S&P? And because of that, what's the strategy for investors ahead? Well, she, she just named a good one. Uh, there's nothing wrong with 4% cash. Uh, and that's probably this the most mismanaged asset among investors right now. A lot of brokerage accounts still facing, paying 50 basis points when there's plenty of of banks or even a treasury bill that'll pay you more. Having said that, uh, I think there, there's a good time to buy good value stocks. There's opportunities out there. Uh, you got to stay invested in some assets, but under allocating the stocks and bonds, over allocating the cash and, and hedge funds and, and high quality assets is probably a good thing to do right now. And Kathy, your takeaway from the action that we've recently seen in the bond market, we were talking about that earlier in the show with the 10 year yield right around 3.7 today. Do you see that remaining relatively range bound in the months ahead? Probably, most likely. It's you know hard to tell for sure. But what we're trying to do with our clients is is actually invest in fixed income. It's been a long time since we've been encouraging clients to go back into fixed income, and the opportunity is there right now. Municipals, uh, investment grade corporates. I would stay away from high yield personally. I've seen too much over my career. Uh, in, in, in environments like this where, where companies do have trouble with debt. So I would avoid the high yield. Dory, energy's had a rough couple of days. What's ahead in 23? Uh, did you say energy? Energy, yes, sir. Yeah, oh, no, I'm bullish on energy just okay. like last year. Uh, the, the, the supply issue is a much bigger thing than the demand, and the market's been more reactive to seasonal demand issues and recession issues on demand when we have a long-term not only supply problem, but a infrastructure supply problem. So I'm bullish on that. The market's still cheap. You can look at something like a, a Pioneer that sells extremely cheap, very low leverage, major dominant position in, in the uh, uh, Permian, and you get a, a yield of, uh, you know, 13%. You know, it's an incredible stock, and you probably got 100 basis points upside to it. All right, Dory Wiley, mm -hmm. Kathy Enwistle, we got to leave, leave it there. Thanks so much for joining us here this afternoon. We want to get to some breaking news. 62-year-old William Rick Singer, the mastermind behind the 2019 college admissions scandal, has been sentenced to three and a half years in prison. Now, Singer was behind the scam known as Varsity Blues that allowed wealthy parents, including actresses Lori Laughlin and also Felicity Huffman, to pay large sums of cash to get their kids into top universities. Now, Singer's operation included falsifying standardized test scores and bribing coaches who had to say in the admissions process. Prosecutors say that Singer took in more than 25 million dollars from clients. Singer will have to pay millions in restitution and forfeitures in addition to his prison sentence. Well, coming up, the chaos in the house, vote after vote and still no speaker. We have the latest for you after the break.
Despite prodding from former President Trump in nearly two days of voting and deliberations, there is still no Speaker of the House. A sixth vote is underway as no candidate has been able to get the 218 votes needed to win the seat. Senior columnist Rick Newman here with more. Kevin McCarthy or Kevin McAllister from Home Alone, I'm not sure. But this appears to be the Knives Out third installment. They beat Netflix to the punch. What's going on here? Oh, Knives Out ended way sooner than this, than this is going to end and with less drama. Um, so McCarthy, I mean, 20 um, of the most right-wing Republicans are just basically flailing away at McCarthy. That's what's going on right now. They are, um, they're not persuadable, it seems. Um, there are things that McCarthy, in theory, could offer in order to get their votes, uh, but that would be unacceptable to people in the middle. So th this is basically uh, a null set. It appears that, M that McCarthy cannot win this. Um, however, uh, it also appears that he's not ready to throw in the towel and let somebody else step in, and meanwhile, uh, nobody else can get enough votes to do this. I mean, the, the, the one person who's gotten the most votes in every tally over, overall is a Democratic leader, Hakeem Jeffries. That's from um, So if Hakeem Jeffries got an extra, I think, six votes, he would be the six? speaker. Now, he's not going to get those six votes. Um, and so the question, obviously, is, is how, how is this going to end? And I honestly don't know. I mean, um, th so the latest reporting is that somebody such as Rep. Steve Scalise who is a uh, he's pretty conservative, and he hasn't alienated the far right 20, uh, the 20 rabid Republicans. Uh, some call them the Taliban 20 um, because they're, they're, they're sort of so extreme within the Republican Party. Um, he hasn't alienated them the way McCarthy has, so he could, I guess, if, this, if McCarthy's willing to say, sure, you step in and you become the leading candidate, you see if you can get this job. And uh, but he would still have to get all the moderate votes within the Republican caucus. It does not appear that Democrats are going to give any Republican any votes. So Democrats are not going to give them a way out. Well, they could. Oh, they're going to give them as much rope as they want. Absolutely. And they're also I mean, there's also reporting that what Democrats are saying, um, we will we will we will give McCarthy. We could we could scrounge up 10 votes for him if he would let us have a ton of control over who the committee chairs are, let us have a lot of control over how the money gets spent, guarantee we're going to extend the federal borrowing limit, like essentially do all these things that would cost McCarthy even more votes among Republicans. So, um, the, you know, the record for number of votes it takes to get a House speaker, I think, is 133 votes wow. at some, some point in the 1800s, and that went on for two months. Um, so are these guys going to set the record for the most absurd, um, contr you know, control of House in the history of Congress? Possible. Rick, what do you think this really tells us just about where the GOP is today? Yeah. So much divisiveness just within their own party. Obviously, policy implications like we talked about yesterday, and it seems like we're even further away from a possible speaker than we were 24 hours ago. So let me give you three quick things, I think. First of all, um, Trump weighed in on this this morning. We've all already forgotten about this because guess how much effect Trump had on this outcome? Absolutely zero. No, he said, everybody get behind McCarthy. He couldn't even scrounge McCarthy. The extra, I mean, he, I think he needs six votes. He needed to flip six of these. He didn't even move Matt Gates. No, he didn't move any of them. So Trump looks like a big nothing burger, even within his own party, and even among the Trumpiest people within the Republican Party. So I think you can conclude uh, Trump's power is waning big time. Second, um, is this how, is this what Republicans Republicans have to offer in terms of their management style and their leadership. If it is, it's pathetic. Um, and uh, I, I, I don't know how they they're going to do much better once they actually get a speaker and they have to start making some decisions because the same dynamics will apply, which is you're going to have these 20 or so uh, bomb throwers who will be able to scuttle any, any Republican vote they want. And the third is what is the message Republicans are going to be now sending to voters for, with regard to 2020? Vote for us if you want chaos and mayhem. That, that's what it looks like. And I don't see any sort of mechanism that will impose, impose discipline on the Republican uh, House Republicans during yeah. the next two years to change that. So I think Democrats are absolutely gleeful. This is almost better for Democrats than if they had actually retained control of Congress. Certainly is remarkable. It's hard to Absolutely. wrap your head it's a great around point. all of this. Rick, thanks so much. We want to continue talking about this, the vote for speaker, and also the pressure that is mounting on the GOP. We want to bring in Brian Gardner. He's live in D.C., Stiefel Chief Washington Policy and a strategist. Excuse me there. Brian, just your takeaway, your thoughts on the pressure that's mounting, what has transpired over the last, what, 24 hours or so, and how this sets us up here in the new year.
Yeah, so I mean, it, it's been something to to watch. Um, you know, for for political geeks, this is the Super Bowl. Um, uh, in some respects, but it's uh, it, it doesn't put the Republican Party in a very good light. Um, it it, it has become uh, uh it, it, the two parties have really flipped, right? It, you know, I grew up in the '70s and the '80s, and the Democrats were the party of dysfunction coming out of the '68 uh, uh, convention in Chicago. The the roles of the two parties are completely flipped. The Republicans, which used to be the party of law and order and discipline and the party of ideas, has become a populist party run amok. Um, and that, to Rick's point, that sets up a very potentially dangerous and volatile second part of the year when Congress has to reauthorize uh, appropriations for spending and raise the debt ceiling. The Super Bowl, though, is still a beautiful thing. This is more the Pro Bowl, just a complete and utter mess, Brian. What, if anything, could this Republican House get through now that they do have control? So once, once there is a fully constituted House and it's open for business, um, probably next week, um, Despite some of the rancor, I, I do think there are a few things that can be worked on on a bipartisan basis. I do think there are enough cooler heads out there on some of the lesser issues that don't get the that that don't drive emotions like debt and deficits. So I'm thinking cryptocurrency um, in the wake of the FTX collapse um, and the, the disruptions in the digital asset space. I do think there are serious people on Capitol Hill in both parties who are trying to figure out how to revise the rules, the regular regulatory framework as it applies to digital assets. I think both parties are interested in looking at social media. They're coming at it from different angles, but there's going to be a lot of attention paid to social media, technology in general, antitrust issues. Again, the parties may disagree, but there is this sense that uh, that both parties want to look at antitrust rules. So um, yeah, it, it's a tough environment. It's um, very combative. But once you kind of get to the second tier of issues away from that first tier that really drive emotions, I do think that there is a possibility of getting some things accomplished uh, in the next two years. Brian, in terms of the short-term impact that this could have for investors, that it could have for the markets, because we know investors hate uncertainty. When they're looking at this type of chaos down in Washington, does that signal, I guess, some risk here for the market, at least in the short term? Yes. Yeah, so, so, so far, the markets have kind of thrown this off and, and disregarded um, the signals that are coming out of Washington. But there are very clear signals to investors for the second half of the year. In the second half of the year, sometime in the third quarter, the debt ceiling is going to have to be raised. And what Republicans are signaling today is they are ill-equipped to pass an increase in the debt ceiling. They think they have leverage to get all sorts of concessions in return for raising the debt ceiling. Um, I think they're going to overplay their hand. I think we're going to wind up kind of in a stalemate as we did in 2011. And as I remind people, the, the, the equity market had a pretty steep sell-off in the summer of 2011, and it took it months to recover. Um, so I think we're setting ourselves up for that. And then again, uh, government spending has to be reauthorized uh, in September. Uh, the, the fiscal year ends September 30th. And there's a lot of uh, raw emotions and bad blood coming out of what the, how the omnibus that just passed, how that was handled. Now, we can argue about whether it was handled the right way, whether it's the right size, all of that. But House Republicans are not in a mood to be uh, collaborating with the Senate uh, in a way that that gives me confidence that there's not going to be a government shutdown in, in October. So I, I think odds of a government shutdown uh, are, are, are rising. And I think what we're seeing this week is pointing to that. Uh, who emerges from this bleep show, Brian, as the Speaker of the House? I, I don't know. I mean, it, 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 it's the ultimate question. Um, so they're, they're going to adjourn after the, the the ongoing vote. They will meet again tonight. I do think there are a handful of the 20 that can be persuaded um, to vote for McCarthy. I don't think there's enough of them that are persuadable. Then Republicans have to figure out what's next. Um, Rick was mentioning Steve Scalise. I'm not convinced Scalise can get 218 votes. Remember, you only need uh, you can only afford to lose five as, as Republicans. So I think there would be five holdouts. Jim Jordan's name has been thrown out there. I think Jordan would definitely lose five votes. 
Um, so I, I don't, I don't, among the 20, I, I'm questioning how many of those 20 are able to get to a yes with anybody. Um, and it, it, it's, uh, it's really up in the air. I think this could go on for several more days. I, I don't dismiss McCarthy as much as some others do. Um, I, I think they're going to, I think tonight is his last chance. And if they are able to come to some some sort of accommodation, he could emerge tomorrow. But if he doesn't emerge tomorrow morning, I think it's over for him. But after that, it's it's a very open question. Absolute madness. Tried nominating Rick. He didn't want the job. We'll try nominating you, Brian. <laughs> you don't have to be in the house to be the speaker. You don't. If, if nominated, I will not serve. So uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, go, I'll go with that Sherman-esque uh, declaration. Cross one more off the list. Brian Gardner, good to see you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Coming up, been thinking about buying a used Tesla? Well, prices have fallen sharply. We'll tell you what it'll cost you when we come back. Auto sales numbers are out and GM has reclaimed its title as the top seller in the U.S. Sales for 2022 totaling 2.27 million. That's up two and a half percent from what we saw a year ago and pushing shares higher today. Look at that. The stock closing up just about two and a half percent. Pros Supermanian here with more on this and Pros. I guess good news for GM, but overall clearly a challenging year for the auto industry. Yeah, for sure. Uh, GM, good news there. They're number one overall in America, number one in total truck sales a number of things like that. Up 2.5% last year sales-wise, up 41% in Q4, so sort of reflecting that they really had an improvement compared to last year with all the chip shortages and, and things like that. Uh, so Toyota, their, their rival, you see they're 2.1, so barely missing out, but down 9.6%. They were really hit this year with those part shortages, chip shortages. They've cut their outlook a couple times last year, so not a good year for them, but still 2.1 million, nothing to sneeze at there. Uh, looking ahead, GM actually sees that their ice and gas power businesses actually will see potential sales of across the industry of 15 million to four, to, to, from, from 14.1 million uh, last year. So they see the actual gas business growing overall for the industry. And then EVs, of course, they up their bolt production to 70,000 per year. They have three new EVs come out next year and their factory zero all EV plant opens mid next year too. So a lot going on for GM as well. Just remarkable, that split, though, in year over year between GM and Toyota. Wow. All right, broader expectations across the industry as the 22 numbers roll in. What are you thinking? Yeah, as we get more and more of these numbers forward tomorrow, then the industry will put together their sort of 
projection for what 2022 was. So we're looking at Edmonds here, um, looking at some, a number of uh, around uh, 13.9, sorry, Cox Auto, 13.9 million for 2022. That's down 8% from last year down 20% from peak levels sitting like 2015, 2016. So, you know, we're not going to see these days before 17 million units sold a year. Those, those, those days are over. Like automakers are sort of seeing the numbers and higher prices, uh, price inflation, higher rates. We're never going to see those days, at least for a long time. And right now it's more about, can you sell uh, cars at a decent margin, make money and not sell as much? Yeah, auto dealers really like that COVID uh, dynamic, right? They didn't have a lot of inventory, but the prices were sky high. They didn't have to have a lot of employees. It all worked out well for them. Proz, good to see you. Thank you. All right, let's talk more about auto sales. They're expected to hit that number he just mentioned, 13.9 million for 22. That's an 8% decline from the year prior, well below that pre-pandemic average, which was around 17 million here to discuss that. Uh, as well as GM and the passing lane right by Toyota is Pat Ryan, the founder and CEO of Copilot, which helps consumers buy new and used cars. Good to see you, sir. What do you make of that dynamic as GM increases sales and Toyota falls off more than 9% or the fact that we're looking at, is this a new norm of auto sales in that 13 to 14 million units? There's still a lot of pent up demand. If you look at it, Toyota has almost no supply on the ground. They, Toyota Lexus combined have about 21 days worth of cars on their lots. So they're still in very high demand. They just don't have the supply. The Japanese automakers overall have really struggled to catch up on the chip side and uh, struggled to keep up with the demand. Their cars have been very high demand throughout the pandemic. Uh, where GM supplies caught up, GM supplies up quite a bit. It's uh, closer to 60 days. And so you know, GM's really uh, come back in its supply that's allowed them to sell in ways that Toyota hasn't been able to. So if Toyota can produce and get caught up to GM on the production side, I would expect to see that, that race be more neck and neck than it was at the end of this year. Uh, Toyota just lost too much ground during the middle of the year, unable to keep production up. And, you know, you see it with their, their market today. Uh, if you buy a Toyota this in the fourth quarter, they only gave you one key because they couldn't have afford enough uh, chips to give you two keys. Pat, let's compare what's going on in the new car market and comparing that with the used car market because pricing, especially in the used car market, we've seen that come down pretty substantially. You sent over numbers saying that the average price of a used car was 31000 That's down 6% year over year. When you take a look at pricing, let's start there. Do you expect that to trend even lower this year and how low? We do. It's an interesting, the markets are all different. So if you look at the older used cars, they started to really come down at the beginning of the year. They've been dropping all year. They're down considerably. Uh, and you see, you saw a really big decline in those, those prices that slowed in the fourth quarter, where the substitute for new cars, those one to three-year-old nearly new used cars, those really didn't start to slow until August. They actually peaked in August. So we've seen a big drop in those numbers. Those numbers are really moving down uh, dramatically in the fourth quarter as new car supply has come back. New car supply is up over 70% from its low in the summer. And that's going to accelerate as people begin to uh, continue to struggle, I think, a little bit with the interest rate payments. The Toyota uh, management said that they're seeing for the first time cars they thought were pre-sold that aren't closing because people look at the interest rates and say, oh, maybe not. And those used car prices are starting to soften because of it. And we expect that to accelerate as we get into 23. And Shauna mentions that 6% decline. Uh, nothing compared to the EV drop off four times that 24% and Tesla's down 25%. What do you make of that drop off of a cliff? Well, it's interesting. You know, the Tesla vehicle price, used vehicle price and the Tesla <laughs> a stock price seem to have had an equally tumultuous year. You know, the, the electric prices really took off when the Ukraine war started. And we saw a huge increase that peaked in the summer. And then since then, we've seen a huge drop off, 25% down uh, in terms of what used Teslas have gone down, which is interesting because, you know, new Teslas prices have been going up uh, because of the scarcity of uh, battery related minerals and, and the ability to just get production of electric vehicles uh, as high as they'd like. So the reality is that the Tesla bubble sort of peaked this summer and then popped. But it's it's not just that the prices have come down, even though prices have come down 25%. What we're looking at is, is near record high supply of used Teslas on the market. 
hard to imagine with new Tesla prices going up that that's not going to put some real pressure on the Tesla stock because the difference in a two-year-old Tesla is hard to say it's worth $25,000, $30,000. Yes, certainly. I do agree with that. Pat, you, you are co-pilot. You help people. You help potential buyers get the best deal, whether they're buying a new or used car. If some of our viewers are in the market, I guess what are one, two, or three tips that you have or they need to keep in mind when they are purchasing their next vehicle? Yeah, I think it's really important to really shop around and to be patient. Uh, both the new car supply is going up. Incentives reach record lows in the middle of this year for new cars. They're going up, but they're down 71% year over year. So you're going to see incentives climb throughout 23. You're going to see availability climb for new cars throughout 23. And you're going to see used car prices on the other side drop throughout 23. So this is a great time to be patient, a great time to shop around. That's why we tell our, our members, hey, we'll look at every dealer in the country for you and find you the ones who are really adjusting to the market because no one wants to be that person who's the last one to pay the, the record high price. And there's risk of that. There's a lot, of, a lot of diffusion in the market in terms of what prices look like. A lot of dealers trying to hold on for the old profits and uh, consumers need to be savvy about that. I think the second one to keep in mind is, first one is on used car, uh, new, new cars, you know, definitely wait for the incentives on used cars, wait for prices to come down more, they're accelerating. These All these forces are coming your way. After two years of being a dealer and automaker market, it's now gonna become a consumer market in 23. The last one is if you have a trade-in and your trade-in is a lot of equity, that may be the one reason to buy sooner because well, those used car prices going down are gonna impact the price and value of your trade-in. So that'd be the only reason to buy now is if you have a trade-in with a lot of equity, maybe that makes it better to get a new car right now. That's probably the best combo is to sell a trade-in, a used car, and buy a new car right now. Otherwise, patience will be your friend, and you'll see people, it's like the stock market. I expect that 23, as we get into mid to late 23, we're going to see that the uh, car market prices have adjusted the way the stock market has, and being patient will pay off for consumers who do. You don't want to rush to any big decisions there. Pat Ryan, co-pilot, a CEO. Thanks so much for joining us here this afternoon. Coming up next, planning for your retirement. We are going to tell you the best ways to protect your savings after leaving your job. That's next.
ETFs just closed their second most active year ever in all. $611 billion flowed into the ETF industry during 2020, according to data from Vetify. So what's in store for 2023? Joining us now to discuss is Todd Rosenbluth, Vetify's head of research. Good to see you, sir. So we're about done looking back on last year, but in how that informs the future, what do those inflows tell us about what's coming to the industry? Well, we saw a number of bright spots within 2022 that make us encouraged heading into 2023. Of course, remember, we had a down year for equity and fixed income markets. So the second best year ever uh, is impressive. We had a record year for actively managed ETFs, a record year for smart beta ETFs, a record year for value oriented ETFs. And these are all trends that are set up as we look towards 2023. And as we at the team at Vetify are putting together the exchange ETF conference, how we're setting the agenda so that advisors can stay informed about what these trends have as we look towards the future. Well, Tom, what are you hearing from advisors and how has or has the conversation changed at all from 2022 to what we look ahead here for 2023? So 2022, as mentioned, was a year where value was a strong performer. Value index-based products outperformed growth alternatives. The S&P 500 value outperformed the S&P 500 growth by over 2,000 basis points. Similar outperformance for the Russell 1000 value versus growth. And advisors are telling us they believe that value is going to continue to outperform in 2023. We did a survey of advisors and value significantly was more popular than growth. What's concerning to us about that, not that people are confident in value, is that the value indexes are rebalanced and reconstructed, certainly the S&P 500 based ones, at the end of 2022. So what used to be in a growth index is now in value. What used to be in a value index is in growth. So let me give you a couple of examples. ExxonMobil and Chevron and United Health. these are typically value-oriented stocks that helped the iShares S&P 500 value ETF, IVE, be a significant outperformer. They are no longer in IVE. They're now in IVW, the iShares S&P 500 growth ETF, whereas companies like Amazon and Microsoft are now found within the iShares S&P 500 growth index. I'm sorry, in the iShares S&P 500 value index ETF. So value might not perform as well against growth because of what's inside the portfolio. So we can see here names you probably wouldn't expect to see within a value portfolio like Microsoft and Amazon and Meta platforms, long time growth company, but that has fallen out of favor with many investors. So anything trends to avoid in 23? So we expect that the Federal Reserve is going to continue to raise interest rates uh, as we start 2023, but then perhaps slow down. So I think investors are trying to rethink where their fixed income exposure is going to come, in what form are they willing to take on interest rate risk or not. And we could see products that are more more rate sensitive. So products like the iShares three to seven year treasury ETF uh, or, or longer term products like TLT, the iShares 20 year treasury ETF, if they're concerned about recession. But we think investors are going to be steering clear of some of those short term oriented products. And as we are looking to a pivot in 2023, advisors are top of mind as to how they move their interest rate sensitivity looking out into the rest of the year. All right, excellent advice there. Thank you, Todd. Appreciate that. He's from Vetify, head of research. That's the ETF report brought to you by Invesco QQQ. Appreciate that, Todd. All right, it's a new year. For some, that might come with a new job and a new 401k plan. In 2021, Fidelity processed 1.1 million retirement fund cash outs for clients, and over half of those clients were under the age of 35. Cashing out comes with costly penalties if you're not at the age of retirement but a new law will help encourage people to keep their money in retirement accounts. Yahoo Finance's Carrie Hennon has those details. Hi there, Carrie. Hey, great to be here. Yeah, this is good news for retirement savers. Um, the new law, the Secure 2.0 Act, which will kick in uh, later this year, um, has this critical provision that allows your previous, your former employer, to automatically transfer your for, your retirement balance in your 401k, your 403b, 
into your new employer plan without you having to do anything. It's very seamless. Um, this is a big deal because um, it, it sort of paves the way for that to happen. And it allows people to keep that money growing for them for future financial security. Because here's what happens, Dave. One in three workers cash out of their retirement accounts when they change jobs. And when you're between the ages of 20 and 30, that jumps up to like 41% of people do. And, and trust me, I did this myself when I was 30 years old. And I regret it as probably one of my biggest financial regrets that I have when I think about what that $5,000 might be worth today. So uh, what it is, is this money, if you have under $7,000 now, they can automatically transfer this. And so let me just give you a quick example. Retirement Clearinghouse ran these numbers uh, that I, I ran it on their calculator. They have it on their site. If you're 25 years old and you have $5,000 in your 401k, and if you, uh, assuming a 5% return and you're not adding anything more into that, if you take that money out at the age of 67, which would be your full retirement age, you'd have $38,808. But if you decide that you're going to cash that money in right now when you're, skip, when you're changing jobs, um, you would pay $500 to the IRS. And um, no, you'd pay $1,000 to the IRS. And you'd also have a $500 fine because before 59 and a half, it's a 10% penalty and taxes on the funds you withdraw. So you'd have $3,500 versus if you just let it hang out. So this is really a big deal because a lot of people do change jobs and they cash out. And or if it's a small amount of money, they may even forget that they have it and the employer, the previous one, rolls it into an IRA. So I, I, I think this is really good news. Fidelity and Vanguard have been working on having a clearinghouse kind of thing that would enable this to happen. And the new law really jumpstarts this, which will help people, you know, hang on to that money, keep it invested in their retirement plans. Yeah, Carrie, when you're talking about the penalty really highlights why people need to keep their money invested in their 401k. But I think a lot of people are faced with this new decision or a big decision when they're starting that new job, how much they should be allocating to a 401k, how much they should be saving for retirement? How should people be thinking about those decisions? Yeah, I think obviously it's a personal decision. If you're uh, trying to allocate for your new job, I always encourage people to try to at least save as big a per the percentage of your salary that at least you get your employer match. If your employer matches funds, so whether that's 5%, 7%, whatever it might be, try to do that. And you can auto escalate that. So each year you can bump it up a little higher whenever you feel more comfortable. But the fact is, you know, uh, Shauna, a lot of people cash out when they switch jobs. Like I said, I did. I did it to pay uh, credit card bills. And that's what happens. People cash out because you know what? They absolutely need the money to pay for medical bills. They, they're going through a divorce, whatever it might be, they need the money. And so the, the point is, it makes it very tricky uh, to stay away from that money and keep it invested. And that's why this new provision, I think, will allow people to seamlessly keep the money without feeling that they need to tap out. But I'm telling you, when you're 20 years old or 30 years old, retirement seems like a long time away. And it's really feels unreal to you. And you're like, gosh, I need that money right now. So so the more you can save, the better you'll be for your future financial security. Important to keep your money in your 401k. Carrie Hannon, thanks so much for that update there, on advice, I should say. All right, well, coming up next, we go back to CES to take a look at some of the autonomous vehicles. Look at that behind Ellie Garfinkel. She'll join us live. She'll tell us exactly what's new with that. What is that, dump truck? Dump truck, when we come back.
Our coverage of CES 2023 continues. Allie Garfinkel live on the ground in Las Vegas. And Allie, a massive Caterpillar truck there behind you. Yeah, Shauna, so here's the thing. Autonomous vehicles are something we talk about a lot and they're big here at this year's CES. But the places that these trucks, that these vehicles are mostly being used are industrial and commercial applications. This truck behind me, Dave, earlier you said that a semi sounded intimidating. This truck behind me <laughs> is 100 tons. It is the 777 mining truck from Caterpillar. Now, 100 tons sounds like a lot to you and me, but to them, it's actually pretty small. Despite the fact they had to take this one apart, the big ones are about 400 tons. So chew on that for a second. Right. Um, the the, uh, the thing that we were talking about is we were like, it's kind of like the sand crawler in Star Wars and we're like all like little Jawas next to it. Um, <laughs> the other thing about it, too, is this truck is used for mining and there are actually other mining truck applications, too. Right. Like, for instance, we talked to a company called Applied EV and what they do is they actually have a range of autonomous industrial vehicles that can do things at range from mining, for example, to grocery delivery. They're actually and lest you think that that is completely future. Some of those grocery delivery trucks are actually already on the road in Melbourne, Australia. So there's, I would say, you know, bottom line here, autonomous vehicles are happening at CES in a big way. These industrial applications seem to be the most practical ones. Um, and I kind of love it, especially this thing. And I also completely fear it. Yeah, it just the size of you compared to that massive truck in the back. I never thought of Cal Caterpillar as a high tech company, but looks like I'm wrong. Ali Garfinkel, we look forward to hearing all the latest from CES over the coming days. Thanks so much. All right, it being dry January and all my stock to watch for tomorrow is Constellation Brands, ticker symbol STZ. The company produces and markets beer, wine, and spirits such as Corona and Casa Noble Tequila. It reports its third quarter earnings before the market opened tomorrow. Analysts expecting earnings of $2.88 a share on revenue of $2.4 billion. Cheers. Coming up, luxury fitness company Equinox is turning heads over their latest campaign, We Don't Speak January. We'll dive into the company's new manifesto with Equinox president Scott DeRue right after the break. There he is.
Luxury fitness company Equinox has a message for newcomers to its gyms. Don't try and join on January 1st. Equinox banning people from signing up for a new membership on New Year's Day. It's part of their new campaign that they call we don't speak January. The company writing in a message, quote, January is a language we don't understand. It wants you to start something when you should already be in the middle of it. Here to discuss that and more, we want to bring in Scott DeRue, president of Equinox, joining us now. Scott, it's great to have you. This certainly has sparked a lot of conversation about Equinox. Some people are in support of it. Others have taken a massive issue. There was a headline from the Miami Herald that I want to bring up saying, Quote, stop gatekeeping fitness. So let me give you the floor. Explain this We Don't Speak January campaign and why you made the decision not to let members or new members join your gym on the 1st. Thank you. And first of all, Happy New Year and thanks for having me. Uh, this is driven by a core belief uh, of who we are as a brand. Uh, and it's really about we all have positive change that we want to see in our lives. We all have goals. We all have results that we desire. And what we understand is that it requires commitment to achieve those goals and achieve those results. And commitment is the soul of our business. It's the soul of Equinox. And the idea that our community really harnesses is that to achieve these goals and achieve our, our results that we desire, it's not a one-day thing. It's an everyday thing. And that's really the message, the point of view, the brand philosophy that we're sharing with the world and that our community really resonates with. And Scott, earlier today, we had on a rival CEO of yours from Planet Fitness. He said he had seen the ads. I want you to listen to his thoughts. It's a judgment-free zone is what we call ourselves, right? And, you know, regardless of what your why is and the reason you want to get off the couch, whether it's January 1st, July 1st, you know, you're doing it for your kids, you're doing it because you want to feel better, have more energy, you know, we don't judge. So, yeah, I, I saw that, but, you know, that's not us. So that's not us. Is this kind of like Globo Gym Average Joes from Dodgeball Dynamic? Or why does this fit your members and not theirs? Look, our member community uh, understands that commitment is what delivers the results. And the problem with really January is that the mainstream wellness industry, if you will, creates all the gimmicks, all the fads around the turn of the new year. And we believe that it's not about January. It's about a long-term commitment to achieving those goals and seeing the results that you desire. And the thing about our Equinox community is our members understand that we're partners with them in that shared commitment. And the mainstream wellness industry is built on the idea that you sign up, but you never show up. And at Equinox, we're the exact opposite. We want you to engage because it's that engagement and that shared commitment that's gonna help you achieve your goals wherever you are in the fitness journey, wherever you are in your life journey. And I, I, read, I saw a survey the other day that said that 80% of people who sign up for traditional gym memberships in January never go in February and March. Think about that. At Equinox, it's the exact opposite. 95% or more every year of the members who, show, who sign up to be Equinox members in January, they show up in February, March, April, and beyond, over 95%. And so we're very different than that mainstream wellness movement because of commitment being the soul mm -hmm. and the heart of our business and our community. Well, Scott, let's talk about your members, the pricing that they must pay in order to belong to your gym. And maybe that's a reason why they are more committed than some of the members of other gyms. Because taking a look at the price that you could pay per month, we know it varies from city to city. But the average that you guys sent over, average cost is $250 per month. And I know you have raised that price of membership uh, pretty consistently over the last several years. Walk us through the pricing strategy there and I guess how you balance raising prices without getting too much backlash from your members that you value so much? 
Well, it's about the experience and it's about creating an environment where our members are inspired by our talent, our programming, with that shared commitment to helping them achieve their, their goals and their results. And what we've seen through the course of 2021 and 2022, as we've reemerged out of the pandemic, is the demand to be part of the Equinox community has never been stronger. Nine out of the 12 months in 2022, we set all time sales records. And as we've started 2023, the same is true. That momentum is carried forward and it all comes back to the experience that we create, the community that we built all around this shared commitment that is long-term to help people achieve their goals. We all have positive change that we wanna see in our lives. We yeah. also know that that requires a commitment and that commitment is the core of who Equinox is. Well, Scott, I was going to go get a drink, but you, you've inspired me. <laughs> I'm going to instead go work out, buddy. I appreciate the pep talk. It'll be interesting if expensive gyms are recession-proof in 23. Great to see you. Scott Daru from Equinox. Great to have you. That'll do it Great for today's... Yeah, thanks, buddy. That'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. We'll see you tomorrow, 3 o'clock Eastern time for all your coverage leading up to and after the bell. Push-ups? Push-ups, burpees, we got it burpees, all. Burpees, I'll do push-ups. See you tomorrow. <laughs>